All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are locked on Falcons. I'm your host, Aaron Freeman, and today I'm giving you my rapid reaction to the Falcons 21 to 14 week 12 win on the road over the Jacksonville Jaguars. <laughs> You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So guys, you know me, I'm Aaron Freeman, been covering the Falcons for many years, formerly at Falcfans.com, RIP, still going strong on Twitter, at Falcfans, and of course, the host of this illustrious Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And on today's Locked On Falcons podcast, I'm giving you my rapid reaction to the Falcons week 12 win over the Jacksonville Jaguars by a score of 21 to 14. We'll be talking about the game summary for those of you guys that missed it. Uh, of course, I'll be handing out my grades for each phase of the game, talking offense, defense, and special teams. And then you'll get my final thoughts on the game. And those will sort of be dealing with the Falcons playoff potential. Uh, now that they're in the heat of the playoff race at, with a five and six record, we'll talk about whether or not this win kind of redefines the narrative surrounding not only this team, but Arthur Smith uh, and his play calling in particular. So we'll get into all of that towards the end of today's episode. But before we get into that, I do want to thank you guys for making Locked on Falcons your first listen each and every day. Uh, of course, Locked on Falcons is free and available on a variety of podcast platforms, including Apple Odyssey, Google and Spotify. And of course, also now available in video format on YouTube, of course, Make sure you subscribe to the Locked on Falcons YouTube channel. Make sure you give us a like. Make sure you leave a comment, all that stuff. So let's jump into that Falcons game summary, looking at, you know, the ups and downs, the trials and tribulations of the Falcons. And, you know, it started off rough for both teams. Neither team was able to score on their opening drive, although they were able to move the ball somewhat. And, you know, it sort of signaled that both quarterbacks we're not going to have a great day. Matt Ryan was generally okay in this game. Uh, Trevor Lawrence was also okay in this game on the Falcons opening possession. Matt Ryan overthrew and opened Mike Davis on a third and seven uh, where he had room to run uh, and catch uh, to convert on that down. Uh, Trevor Lawrence uh, missed the throw to LaVisca Chenault on his uh, opening third down and whatnot. And uh, it sort of signaled that both quarterbacks were going to be scattered shot on this day and, and pretty off the mark. Uh, Matt Ryan was the better of the two, uh, but both quarterbacks were not particularly productive. Both quarterbacks had a touchdown and interception, um, a lot of dinking and dunking, uh, a lot more from the Falcons end of things. There was, you know, both teams had their receivers not really helping out their quarterbacks a ton uh, with the Falcons. It was mostly plays where the receivers weren't really getting open with the Jaguars. You know, there were drops, there were miscommunications, but also Trevor Lawrence was pretty scattershot on his accuracy uh, throughout the game. So things didn't really get into gear for either offense. Um until the second possession. And it, the, basically this was a game of dueling running games. Basically the team that was going to run the ball more effectively was going to be the team that wound up winning the game. And, and that proved the case for the Falcons. And we saw that on their second possession of the game with some solid runs from Cordero Patterson, as well as Wayne Garman. Uh, Patterson had four carries for a combined 41 yards on that drive with the fourth one being his seven yard touchdown run. Uh, Wayne Goldman added 16 yards on two carries and the Falcons had a nine play scoring drive with six of those plays being runs and the Falcons were able to take a seven nothing lead at the end of the first quarter on the ensuing Jaguars possession. Trevor Lawrence would throw his uh, first inter or his only interception of the game after the Jaguars offense was effective moving the ball uh, into Falcons territory thanks to the legs of James Robinson, the Jaguars running back. Uh, and it looked like on that play that Lawrence threw the interception that they were going to get a free play because it looked like initially Dante Fowler had jumped off sides uh, and Lawrence kind of threw it up to Marvin Jones deep uh, overthrew him uh, and Deron Harmon made an easy interception at the one yard line playing that center field position. And, you know, fortunately for the Jaguars, there was a flag on the play, but unfortunately for them, it wasn't on the Falcons. So they did not throw the flag on Fowler for being offsides. Instead, they threw the flag on the Jaguars for illegal formation and thus the interception count him. And then the Falcons, you know, starting out at their one yard line, they did run a QB sneak uh, to try to get under that for the first time this entire season and got one yard off of that. Um, but 
the Falcons didn't really do much on their ensuing possession, but the one notable play happened where it looked like the Jaguars were going to get a three and out and force the Falcons to punt the ball deep in their own territory. But unfortunately, the Jaguars defender uh, jumped off sides on the Falcons punt and the Falcons had a fresh set of downs. The very next play, Cordero Patterson had a 27 yard run. The Falcons didn't really move the ball after that point. But it would basically these types of special teams errors and these sort of mental errors would play the Jaguars throughout the game. And that was really the first one. Um, then you had the Jaguars take over and the Falcons were able to take advantage of that with a turnover. Uh, Anthony Rush, their second turnover of the game, Anthony Rush was able to get some penetration, uh, knock jar the bar loose on James Robinson's carry and Marlon Davidson was able to recover. And the Falcons had very favorable field position starting at the Jaguars 29 yard line. They did not take advantage of it because it looked like they got another three and out uh, and were settling for a 43 yard field goal from young way Koo, which he made. But again, special teams penalties ruined the Jaguars uh, where this time Roy Robertson Harris, their defense attacker was called for a leverage penalty where he used his arms to sort of leap over the Falcons long snapper, Josh Harris, which is not allowed in the NFL. And that gifted the Falcons a first down and a new set of downs uh penalty halfway the distance of the guard 13 yards and then Cordero Patterson took it the rest of the 12 yards on a run play up the middle with a hellacious block from Keith Smith that could sort of clear the hole and Patterson kind of waltzed and dived into the end zone uh, for his second touchdown of the game and that gave the Falcons a 14 nothing lead with less than seven minutes to go in the first half, Jacksonville was then able to march down the field on their ensuing drive. They even converted a third and 22 on a 24 yard catch to LaVisca Chenault. They got a 21 yard play on a great one handed grab by Marvin Jones. But once they got inside the 10 yard line, which would be a theme for the Jaguars, their offense would stall. They, the Falcons got a good defensive play from Darren Hall, got a tackle for loss on a throw into the flat. That was followed by a drop pass by a Jaguars running back. And then they were forced rather than going for it from the three yard line uh, in the closing minutes of the half. They just settled for a 22 yard field goal, which they made. Um, you can criticize the Falcons for some poor clock management there uh, because they rather than calling some timeouts to give the team more opportunities to score after the Jaguar score where they wound up getting the ball back with about 50 seconds left in the half rather than maybe roughly 90 seconds that they would have gotten if they had called a timeout earlier. Um, you know, it didn't really matter because Matt Ryan would basically throw an interception two plays later on the next drive uh, where he was trying to link up with Kyle Pitts on a deep out. Uh, and Tyson Campbell, the Jaguars rookie cornerback from Georgia, uh, baited him, played it perfectly, sort of peeled off his underneath receiver and picked off the interception. But of course, Jacksonville couldn't move the ball in the ensuing 19 seconds to close out the half. So the Falcons retain their 14 nothing or 14 to three lead going into halftime. Jacksonville got the ball to start the second half. Didn't really do much. A.J. Terrell had a nice pass breakup on a third down to stall that drive. The Falcons then got some nice production from Russell Gage and Cordero Patterson, Keith Smith, to start their ensuing possession. Keith Smith, again, had a very physical stiff arm, a hellacious stiff arm, you could say, uh, on his one snag. And then Kyle Pitts finally got involved in the game, having his first catch of the game on that drive in the third quarter uh, with a 19-yard catch and run on that play. And that got the Falcons into the red zone. And then Gage finished the drive with a 12-yard slam slant pass uh, to score in giving the Falcons a 21 to three lead with about eight minutes left in the third quarter. Then the two teams exchanged three and outs. The Falcons ran the ball on all three of their plays in their three and out. And Jacksonville got the ball uh, back and were able to close out the third quarter with a touchdown drive. Uh, they were able to convert a couple of third downs. Um, then uh, tight end James O'Shaughnessy, or as uh, his friends call him, Oshag Hennessy, got behind the Falcons defense uh, on the 21 yard gain. And then Tavon Austin on the next play was able to high point a seven yard pass from uh, Trevor Lawrence in the back of the end zone to get them their first touchdown in the game. Then the Jaguars went for two. Oshag Hennessy was able to beat Michael Walker, uh, who was starting in place for Deion Jones on the two point conversion. And they were able to cut Atlanta's lead 21 to 11 with the third quarter coming to the close. And, and Michael Michael Walker started this game because Deion Jones was out with an injury and it was a pretty rough game for Michael Walker. We've been talking basically for the last, what, eight months uh, about the possibility that this year is going to be Deion Jones is uh, potentially his last year uh, and, and based off of how he's played this year, probably his last year here in Atlanta and the Falcons potentially had a, a sort of homegrown option in Michael Walker to potentially replace him. 
And it, based off of his performance today with a bunch of missed tackles in the open field, he made a couple of nice plays, but uh, for the most part, looked lost a little bit here. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily an impressive sort of audition for that role, but we'll sort of have to see how the rest of the season goes. So then on the Falcons ensuing possession going into the fourth quarter, um, they didn't do a whole lot. Uh, Matt Ryan then missed a third and nine throw to Kyle Pitts throwing behind him. Then the Jaguars started moving the ball, running a lot more read option plays, and the Falcons really didn't do a great job stopping it. Sometimes Trevor Lawrence kept it. Sometimes he handed the ball off, and they were essentially able to kind of matriculate the ball down the field seemingly four or five yards at a time. And then, of course, they got past the 10-yard line on the Falcons' 10-yard line, and all things broke all hell broke loose in the in the Jaguars offense once again stalled inside the 10 and this time it was due to a holding penalty on right tackle Jawan Taylor that backed them up 10 yards and then Trevor Lawrence missed his next three throws and they had to settle for a 34 yard field goal and that did cut Atlanta's lead to 21 14 Falcons got the ball back with about six and a half minutes left in the game and they basically proceeded to run out the clock but early in that drive they had a third and two they were unable to convert that third and two on a Matt Ryan pass um where you can find an open receiver. But fortunately, again, the Jaguars kept shooting themselves in the foot because the Falcons were able to get a fresh set of downs thanks to a holding penalty against cornerback Nevin Lawson. So they had an opportunity to get the ball back with like basically three and a half minutes left in the game. The Falcons proceeded to bleed all another minute off the clock. Jacksonville got the ball back um, and then didn't really do a whole lot uh, with that ensuing drive. Uh, they had a drop. They had a miscommunication. They had a couple of missed throws from Trevor Lawrence and basically the Falcons defense was able to hold. And for once, the Falcons were able to pull off a, a last second win without young way Koo's leg being particularly involved in the game. So that was it for the Falcons. And that got them their fifth win of the season. We'll continue today's locked on Falcons rapid reaction episode, talking about the various grades that I give out for not only the passing and rushing offense, but the passing and rushing defense, as well as that all important special teams unit. And we'll get into that as we continue today's Locked on Falcons podcast. But before we get there, guys, does this sound familiar? You've got that one device that lets you catch the game live, another that lets you stream your favorite shows, and you're also watching sports highlights on your phone. And then you got your father's brother's nephew's cousin's former roommate Deborah's login for your preferred streaming service. Well, I want to tell you about a simple way to get all the entertainment that you love without any of the hassle and a great way to finally get your TV together. That's Direct TV Stream. It brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before so you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes, no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part, besides not having to borrow Deborah's login, is that there's no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with Direct TV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible device required content varies by package. So as we hand out uh, grades, letter grades for the various Falcons phases of the game, starting with the pass offense, I'm, I'm giving them a C. Um, as I said, it was a pretty ho-hum day for Matt Ryan. Kyle Pitts was mostly held in check. He only finished with two catches for 26 yards on six targets. But the Falcons were able to get it done offensively, primarily through their running game, as well as they got some contributions from Russell Gage. He did lead the team with six catches for 62 yards and had that touchdown. Uh, Davis and Patterson combined for five catches for 52 yards. And Falcons running backs accounted for about nine of Matt Ryan's 29 throws. Um, in terms of attempts. And we talked earlier this season about how often the Falcons were checking the ball down to their running backs as opposed to the NFL average, which was last year was about 18% of quarterback throws were to running backs. And the Falcons were hovering around 30% uh, in the early going of the season. And in this game, again, nine out of 29 is basically 30%. So you got a lot of check downs. Now, some of that was due to the fact that the Falcons receivers weren't necessarily getting open. Although I'll be curious to go back and watch the film to see how much of that was, you know, the limited ability of the wide receivers. How much of that was Matt Ryan not seeing it? How much of that was Matt Ryan holding, you know, locking on to Kyle Pitts? How much of that was sort of vanilla route? So I'm not going to come too hard on either direction on the, until I see the film later this week. Um, the one big play that the Falcons had through the air uh, was a 20 yard uh, play to Cordero Patterson in the third quarter. And that was basically like a six yard throw or whatever the case may be. And he had like 14 yards after the catch, uh, basically doing Cordero Patterson things, making the defender miss and winning yak. Kyle Pitts is 19 yard play, which is the second longest pass play. of The game was also mostly yak in that regard. So it was a lot of short of dink and dunking, which if you've been listening to this podcast or watching this podcast for the last several weeks and months, you know that I'm not a huge fan of. So it's hard for me to give too positive a grade based off of that, where it was, you know, it 
they did enough, but it, it was not great. Um, the rush offense, however, I will give an A. This was obviously their best rushing day of the season. They had 149 combined yards on the ground. That was 144 on 27 design runs. Once you take sort of the kneel downs and the scrambles out of it, on those 27 design runs, the Falcons finished with a success rate of 52%. Cordero Patterson himself had a success rate of 63% on 16 carries for 108 yards and two touchdowns. Mike Davis was successful in half of his six carries for 16 yards. Wayne Goleman had a success rate of just 25% on four carries for 19 yards with most of his yardage coming off of that 15 yard carry. And that's one of the reasons why I prefer success rate over yards per carry, because it can be skewed a lot by either negative runs or really long runs. And it makes your yards per carry look better. Uh, basically that success rate is basically showing that Goldman had one good run in this game, which was that 15 yard carry. So, you know, what was interesting going through the box score when I'm figuring out these success rate, and now I'm starting to pay a lot more attention on how often the Falcons run left versus right up the middle. It's interesting going through the box score where the Falcons only ran the ball one time to the right, which has been where they have been most successful running the ball this season. And they're, uh, they had 17 runs running to the to the middle up the middle or in eight runs running to the left side. So clearly the Falcons were, you know, adamant about not running to the right uh, despite his success. Um, you know, one wonders sort of how Drew Dolman's presence in the uh, offensive line affected things. He did alternate some series with Matt Hennessy in this game. I don't know. We'll find out what the snap counts say on Monday as most of you guys are listening to this. Um, but, uh, you know, I imagine it probably broke down close to about half the snaps went to Dolman versus Hennessy in the game. And, you know, is it a coincidence that the Falcons wound up having their best running game of the season with Drew Dolman in the lineup when Drew Dolman was a player that at least if you listen to my scouting report uh, back in the spring and you can find on YouTube now uh, on Locked on Falcons, uh, if you need a refresher, uh, but, uh, you know, Drew Doman was a player that I thought was a better run blocker than Matt Hennessy, at least as a prospect coming out of, of school um, and felt like he projected a little bit better to be a more impactful run blocker. And so is it a coincidence that maybe maybe it is a coincidence again? that will be something that we'll focus on when we break down the film. So um, it does signal the possibility though, that we might see the Falcons make a change. Who could have, who could have imagined, who would have guessed that if the Falcons were going to potentially make a change to their starting lineup, it was not going to be Jalen Mayfield. It was not going to be Caleb McGarry. It was going to be Drew Dolman. I don't think many people would have guessed that. Now, probably after the Patriots game, you probably would have guessed it, but you know, if we were taking bets, certainly, um, you know, two weeks ago, I don't think anybody would have put that much money on that being a, the the first change that the Falcons would have made. So let's move on to the past defense. I give them a B minus. The Falcons defense did their jobs. I, I think a lot of it, though, was thanks to the Jaguars leaving a lot of throws and plays on the field. Um, as I said earlier, there were drops, there were miscommunications, there were scattershot accuracy from Trevor Lawrence in this game. But we did see I'm, I'm giving them a, a bump uh, with that B minus due to seeing increased pressure in this game you know lawrence was only sacked one time in this game but there were multiple times uh where he was pressured and you know fortunately for him and the jaguars his mobility would allow him to escape that pressure but the falcons did finish with six quarterback hits i don't know off the top of my head if that's the most that we've seen from this falcons defense all year long but it feels like certainly one of the better games that they've had uh from a you know affecting the quarterback standpoint you also saw guys making plays on the back end you saw the Harmon interception there were multiple pass breakups moreau and terrell each had one darren hall had one michael walker had one um so the falcons were able to do their job on the back end and the front end uh even if they were getting some help from the Jaguars. We also saw a healthy mix of Darren Hall in this game at nickel. Richie Grant was out there playing as well. But uh, again, that's going to be another thing I'll keep an eye on with the snap counts to see. It, it felt like Hall got the bulk of the snaps. And again, this is a, something that we talked about earlier uh, in, in the spring and summer because, you know, again, this is this May Aaron Freeman is, is happy right now because he was projecting Darren uh, Hall to win the starting nickel cornerback job over Isaiah Oliver back then. He was projecting Drew Dolman to be win the starting center job. So it, it took 12 weeks and it's like, okay, maybe, maybe those May predictions might wind up coming true in the end. They just had to wait 12 weeks into the season. Um, and, you know, Unfortunately, we had a, a season ending injury to Isaiah Oliver to facilitate one of those. Uh, but we'll see how that uh, turns out moving forward. So uh, moving on to the rush defense, I gave them a D plus. The Falcons really struggled to stop the run. Again, the Jaguars weren't ripping off the long runs that the Falcons were able to get a number of times in this game, but they were steadily and efficiently moving the ball down the field with the running game. They were able to get in a lot of 
third and short situations. Um, Jaguars finished with a success rate of 67% on 27 design runs. So, you know, Jaguars had a success rate of 67%, and the Falcons had a success rate of 52%. Um, and some of those successful runs were aided by the presence of, of Trevor Lawrence. Five of their 18 successful runs in this game uh, from Jacksonville were Trevor Lawrence runs. Four of those were on QB keepers off of read options mostly. Uh, and so I wonder if that contributed to it because, you know, when you're trying to – you can keep a defense honest or you can keep that edge rusher honest off the edge if you can sort of use that read option to your advantage. And and seemingly the Jaguars, whether uh, Lawrence was handing the ball off or keeping it, it seemed like the Falcons really couldn't stop it all that much. So their running game was effective. It was able to get them in a, a bunch of third and manageable situations that they were able to convert. You know, they, they had six third and ones in this game, and the five times they ran it, they converted – all five of those times, the one time that they threw it, uh, they did not convert in that situation. So uh, clearly their running game was effective in this game. Their just passing game was just so bad that they just couldn't, you know, put it all together. So our last phase, of course, is the all important, the most meaningful one, the one that matters the most, that special teams. And I'm giving them a B minus. Uh, Koo did make his one kick, although it didn't technically count. Morstead did a good job hunting. He had five punts. Four of those punts were inside the 20. Uh, three were inside the 10. Um, and one was a touchback. So he did a really good job uh, of really helping the Falcons out with field position. And, and this was a welcome change from what we have gotten for the most part this season. Again, uh, as I mentioned several times on the last couple of rapid reactions, Dustin Colquitt has done a much better job. But I would certainly say that this was probably the best punting game that we've seen from a Falcons punter all season long in terms of pinning teams back and, and winning the field position battle. Avery Williams stepped in for uh, Cordero Patterson, who despite dealing with an ankle injury, and that was evidenced by the fact that the Falcons didn't put him on kickoff returns and I don't think really lined him up too often as a wide receiver as they have done in, in recent weeks. At least it didn't seem like that live. Um, so Avery Williams was returning kicks for the Falcons. He did have two solid kick returns that did set up the Falcons in favorable field position. So that's a bonus. He didn't really do much as a punt returner. The coverage units didn't do great. Jaden Mickens had a couple of nice returns, both as a kick and punt returner as well. Frank Darby did force a fumble on one of those punt returns, but the Jaguars uh, did recover on that. So that gives it a little bit of boost, that forced fumble. Uh, so that's why I give them a B minus slightly above average or whatever the case may be so we will uh, close out today's episode giving my final thoughts talking about the falcons postseason potential whether or not this win really changes the narrative for arthur smith and this football team moving forward but before we get there guys i want to thank you for making locked on falcons your first listen each and every day and of course i always have recommendations for what your second listen of the day should be and of course if you're a big fan of the locked on georgia locked on atlanta sports teams then of course we got you covered here on the locked on podcast network with locked on braves locked on hawks and locked on bull Dogs locked. All three are free and available on a variety of podcast platforms, including Apple, Odyssey, Google, and Spotify. And of course, Locked On Braves and Locked On Bulldogs are also uh, free and available on YouTube as well. So it's finally here. It's the best Monday of the year. It's Cyber Monday and built.com is the place to go. You can get at least 20% off everything delicious and healthy site-wide at built.com and you get even bigger discounts of built boost, built broth and built swag and a brand new built bar flavor has just landed just in time for Cyber Monday. You got caramel almond delight. It delivers everything it promises, chocolate, caramel and almonds, and maybe you're craving white chocolate. And for a limited time, there is a special built bar our puff flavor white chocolate cheesecake the yummy protein filled with a pillowy marshmallow center covered in white chocolate tis the season to save and get your taste buds the gift of built bar just head over to built.com for these new flavors and more and get 20 percent off everything with the promo code locked 20 that's locked 20 for 20 percent off site-wide at built.com so now that Thanksgiving has passed, it's the home stretch of both the pro and college football season. And as always, BetOnline is the number one spot for everything football. Head to our new website with the updated desktop or mobile website at betonline.ag. Sign up today and you will receive a 50% welcome bonus with the promo code locked on. And it's not just football. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports from pro in college hoops, NHL, boxing, UFC, and your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait and take advantage of all the amazing offers available at Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. So this game felt very similar to how the Falcons have won a lot of games uh, this season. A lot of dinking and dunking, 
getting an early lead against a bad team, letting that team back into the game, let it, making us nervous, and then you know putting together the one or two drives that they need at the end of the game in order to seal the win. The main difference being that the Falcons' run offense was really working, as well as the Falcons' pass rush looked better than it has looked for a very long time uh, this season, maybe arguably as good as it has looked all season long. Um, and, you know, this is uh, another example of the Falcons taking advantage of a softer schedule. Uh, we, we've known this going into the season. We've been predicting this for a while that the Falcons would have the potential to pad wins, if you want to call it that, against some softer opponents, and that includes the Jaguars. That's why going back to week six, I was seemingly confident that the Falcons would get at least seven wins this year. And, you know, one of those seven wins was against the Jaguars. They're now at five. Uh, they should get another quote unquote cupcake win against the Lions later this year. And then basically they can get the seven wins. They just got to win one out of the three games where they're facing Carolina, New Orleans, or San Francisco the rest of the way. And, you know, the good thing for the Falcons, though, is if they win all three of those games, then you're looking at a team that's nine and eight this season again. They're not going to beat Tampa Bay or Buffalo, but, you know, we can we can hope. Um, and, you know, when I look at the NFC playoff picture and it's hard to predict, but looking at tankathon.com, the Falcons have the eighth easiest remaining schedule uh, uh, in the league right now. But there are two other five win teams like the Vikings and Eagles that have easier schedules than the Falcons have. And I'm currently. um recording this before the final result of the Vikings 49ers game. So maybe the Vikings are technically a six win team uh, by the time you're listening to this. Although when I started recording this, they were down to the 49ers. But, um, you know, for me, I'm looking at the rest of the Falcon schedule when we're talking about their playoff potential. I don't think eight and nine is going to cut it. Right. Because, you know, the Falcons only have two wins in the NFC so far this season. And if you get to eight, and nine, that means potentially you're going to get to five by the end of the season. But, you already have teams that are five win teams or, or, or better that are vying for that uh, wild card spot like New Orleans, Minnesota, San Francisco and Philadelphia that already have four wins within the conference. And so basically, if they can if some of those teams get one or two more wins within the conference, you know, they're going to beat you on that tiebreaker. So that main tiebreaker uh, four wild card spots, um, you know, being conference record, I just don't see how the Falcons are going to be able to win enough of that uh, with an eight, nine record. So to me, in order for this team to have any viable shot of making the playoffs, they got to go nine and eight. And so that means that they have to not only beat Detroit, but they probably have to beat Carolina, New Orleans and San Francisco, which certainly is possible. But basically watching the game today, if this same Falcons team that showed up against the Jaguars showed up in those four games, and again, I, I still think that your best case scenario is a two and two record. So I feel like we need to see more from this team. But there were things that this team can build off of, right? If they can take pieces of this game as well as pieces of other games that we've seen and continue to build off of that, then maybe that is a team that could do a four game sweep in against those four opponents that we just mentioned. And, you know, that's getting the running game on track uh, and, and seeing this running game look more like what we saw today than what they did. And, and again, it's not just simply, oh, the Jaguars have a soft run defense. Jaguars, I think, you know, run defensively going into the week when I looked up those numbers, I think, you know, DVOA had them sort of middle of the pack or if not top 10. Um, so it's not as if like, the oh, the Falcons just played a really bad run defense and were able to feast off of them. Um, I think the Detroit is probably the worst run defense that they face. But I, again, I'm going off the top of my head. So if they can run the football effectively like they did today, if you can get Russell Gage, who has contributed uh, valuable uh, production these last couple of games, then you also get Kyle Pitts back involved in the offense. So like he looked like earlier this season and getting, you know, five, six catches or more a game in addition to the five or six catches that you're getting from Russell Gage, presumably as well. And then your defense is is playing better. Again, we they played really well against New England and they we're better today. Again, it's the Jaguars, um, but it is one of those things where you did see some pressure. Uh, if the run defense can get back to what they were a couple of weeks ago against the Saints, again, you take these disparate parts together, you put them together. That to me starts to sound like a nine and 18 right now. They don't look like a nine and 18. 
Now, if you're asking me, do I think all of that's going to come together? No, I don't. I'm not expecting that to happen. Um, do I feel like, you know, a lot of today's success against the Jaguars was the Jaguars not being able to get out of their own way for a large chunk of the game? Yeah, I do think a lot of that was. But we'll, we'll see what they can do next week against Tampa Bay. They have an opportunity to be competitive uh, against this Bucks team. And you go back to that week two game, you go back to both games uh, last year where the Falcons were competitive uh, against the Bucs. You know, they, they were able to, in week two, get it to a three-score game uh, going into the fourth quarter. You go back to their home game against the Bucs uh, last year. Uh, they were able to build a 24-7 to lead at home against the Bucs team. Um of course, they wound up blowing blowing it because of the Falcons. But you know, this is where I'm talking about where when when people want to sit here and act like the Falcons struggles the last couple of weeks or or like talent lacking talent is we know that the Falcons don't have enough talent to beat the Bucks, right? Like you know, again, I'm not, you can never say never, but like we we know that like they are a way more talented team than us. So no one's expecting the Falcons to to beat the Bucks, but. You know, not having talent is not an excuse for not being competitive in a game. And we've seen the Falcons be competitive against a much more talented Bucks team with comparable levels of talent earlier this season as well as last year. Again, contrary to popular opinion, the Falcons weren't loaded with talent in those final two games against the Bucks at the end of last season because we know Julio Jones wasn't in the lineup back then. And basically the running back was Ito Smith. Right. So, like, don't sit here and act like, oh, the Falcons talent has dramatically fell, fallen off a cliff since week 15. 15 of last year where they were able to put up 24 points in the first three quarters against that Bucks team. So like, that's what I mean where I sit here and I go like, you get this pushback from me um, when it comes to people sitting here trying to say like, Oh, they don't have enough talent. Like, yeah, they don't have enough talent to win, but they don't, they sure have more than enough talent to be competitive for at least a large chunk of the game. So that's what I want to see. Um, you know, my final takeaway when we talk about this game is how conservative the Falcons were. It was effective today. Um, they were able to run the football, but it, to me, when I, you know, you, you got the results, right, is, is basically what I'm getting at. But the process still is a little questionable to me. Uh, and that's what doesn't fill me with excitement, where I would normally be sitting here being like, yeah, we got to win. It was an impressive win, but it's like, I don't know. It, it's impressive, but like, how impressive is it? Because, you know, the idea that the Falcons were stumbling continuing to run the football and running it to the left as much as they did in this game um despite that being you know arguably the biggest weakness of the team besides maybe the pass rush you know to me suggests a a questionable process is is basically they got the results you know but you know the the ends don't justify the means you know i, I feel like that and so well, you know, everybody's going to be focused on the results, and I, I'm sure there'll be plenty of people in the comments or sending me angry emails being like, why you got to be so negative after a win? I've been getting that for 15 years, so I'm, I'm used to it. Is you know, again, I'm not trying to take away from the Falcons winning today. Uh, you know, they executed, right? That's That's been, to me, the biggest problem these last couple of weeks is not executing. Um, but, you know, for me, when I've watched teams over the last, you know, 15-plus years in the league, when, when you have a coaching staff that – seemingly as the Falcons are doing. And again, they got the results that they wanted today. But when you're just kind of ramming a square peg into a, a round hole over and over again, we're like, we're going to stubbornly run the football on first downs. We're going to stubbornly run the ball to the left. Overwhelmingly, uh, the case being, even though those are weaknesses, like 15 years of observing this league tells me that though that's not a great process. That That's not going to necessarily work out long term uh, most of the time. Um, so. We'll see sort of if this performance from the Falcons, the fact that they were able to fit that square peg into a round hole, I guess you could say, is a one off um, or will we see continued success like this over the next six games? Um, and again, if they can get improved play in the trenches and, and maybe that's uh, making a change in the starting lineup at the center position, you know, certainly I'll, I'll sing a different tune than I am today. If we can see improvements and we can see this team consistently executing uh, these quote unquote conservative game plans. So I just basically I didn't walk away from this game feeling like the narrative around this team had suddenly changed. Um, but maybe we shouldn't necessarily look at these games in that way. Again, not every game has to be sort of a season defining or a narrative defining type of performance. It's sometimes you just got to get the results that you want, which is a W. Uh, and then you just kind of it gives you another week and you'll figure it out next week. And then you can have your sort of season defining sort of game against the box uh, uh, 
significantly superior team that you can go and punch in the mouth and say like, yeah, this is the game that sort of redefines our season or whatever the case may be. And, and that may be just sort of what this game was with the Jaguars. So um, we'll be continuing to have these conversations here on Locked on Falcons all week long. Of course, we'll have a guest, uh, Kevin Knight of the Falcoholic, to come on and give his thoughts on uh, Sunday's performance on tomorrow's episode and then of course we'll be reviewing the all 22 on wednesday's episode tuesday night if you're checking us out on youtube and of course you can submit questions uh to be reviewed on the film uh via twitter or facebook at locked on falcons via email at locked on falcons at mail.com or you can leave a comment here on the locked on falcons youtube page and before we duck out of here guys i always have recommendations for what your second listen of the day should be and of course i gotta plug the locked on bets podcast the falcons did cover this week uh, the two-point spread going up against the jaguars so you know don't know if Locked On Bets recommended that. You know, generally I would think Locked On Bets stays away from the Falcons bets. Um, but Locked On Bets has you covered, whether it's football, whether it's basketball, whatever it is. Lee Sterling, the handicapping expert on Locked On Bets, will give you his daily picks, his blowout specials, uh, and his lock of the day. So check out the Locked On Bets podcast, free and available on a variety of podcast platforms, including Apple, Odyssey, Google, and Spotify. So, guys, there you have it. Uh, enjoy the win. Um, you know, I, I can't say that I did, but it, you know, it is what it is. We'll take what we can get beggars. Can't be choosers. All the cliches that you've heard me say over and over again on the Falcons. And we'll see what the film has to say. Uh, and maybe I'll, I'll walk away from the film feeling a little bit better about this win, uh, or feeling a little bit more inspired by this win, uh, than I do on Sunday, uh, evening. So appreciate it guys until then. I hope you had a great holiday weekend. We're back at it this week on lockdown Falcons until then.